Hey everyone, we're back with another Hardware News Recap for the week. And other than getting LN2 in for hopefully a stream with Navi and Ryzen together under liquid nitrogen, we also have some news from the industry, like AMD's AGISA update, removing PCIe 4.0 support from the older boards that sort of unexpectedly, but not really added PCIe Gen 4 support that's now being taken away with the new AGISA update. Intel shipping 10 nanometer parts sort of in volume, but not for the desktop segment. And then uh, some other news items on the partner model 5700s, for example, on WD's losses from their power outage and on Linus trying to kill me. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Gigabyte Z390 AORUS Master Motherboard, which comes equipped with one of the more powerful Z390 VRMs for heavier overclocks. The AORUS Master is also one of the few motherboards with a real heatsink this generation, featuring a mix of high surface area fins and looks-oriented cover blocks. Oh, and it's also got updated RGB illumination. Learn more at the link below. So first up is the, the Linus tried to kill me thing. We went to LTX, it was fun. I got absurdly sick after it, probably just being in proximity to a lot of people after having worked way too much on Ryzen stuff before that. So not enough sleep, getting on a plane, immune systems low, all that stuff. Uh, still sick, but I'm mostly over it at this point. It's been two weeks now, so that's been a lot of fun. And um, we do technically have a couple of extra videos from LTX that we filmed, but the plan was originally to upload multiple a day, just like any other convention we cover. And then uh, I got sick. So. Now it's just a question of, do we put that stuff that's kind of old at this point on the main channel, or do we just shove it over to the side channel, or do we never publish it? So one of them was a video with Alex from LMG. Maybe we'll put that up on the channel here if there's interest, but uh, it's just us talking with him about his workshop that Linus was building out. Um, so that was one of them. Let us know if there's interest, otherwise side channel for that. And then we had another one with Bob Stewart and Rod Rosenberg from BS Mods talking about a case mod they did. Anyway, uh, mostly better now. So uh, restocking the GN store also of note, we restocked the normal, the anniversary shirt, we restocked the uh, Graph logo shirt, and I think the blueprint, uh, there were a lot of shirts that were way out of stock. So if you've been wanting to get some of those and they were out, they're now back. Most of them are in sizes up to at least 4X. We have a couple in cotton that are up to 6X. And then uh, these shirts, the wireframe foil shirts that have been absurdly popular, thank you for that, are almost sold out at this point. We're still, uh, we're basically figuring out the size distribution before um, we put the final order in. So we have a quantity that's almost gone. And then uh, as you order the sizes, we'll make sure we can actually fulfill all the sizes people want. So these are looking like they'll probably be gone in the next maybe five days or so, depending on the, the supply after this video goes up. But if you want one, store.gamersnexus.net to pick that up. Let's get into the news. So AMD AGISA. Uh, AMD's latest update is AGISA 1003ABB. So 1002 is what AMD originally recommended testing and reviewing with. Uh, we used 1003, I want to say it was AB uh, or A. It's been a while. And then there was an AB and now there's an ABB, which is a combo combo fix. And this one, it adds a few fixes, like it fixes the issues with Destiny on Ryzen 3000. So if you've had that problem, it should be resolved now with the new AGISA version anyway. And uh, the other updates, unfortunately, remove PCIe Gen 4 support from the older motherboards that added it in sort of after launch. So that's the downside. The, the LN2 tank behind me is still hissy. I'm not sure if that's picking up or not. but. Sorry, uh, that's the downside. Basically, AMD told us at Computex that it had no plans to officially support PCIe Gen 4 on the older boards, and in fact told us that it was intending to remove them after the launch of Ryzen 3000. So it's followed up on that promise. The reason for this, as given by AMD at Computex to us, was that AMD basically wanted to make sure there were no boards that were offering a feature that it wasn't the board wasn't fully validated for, which could lead to customers having issues with stability or signal integrity or something, just uh, throughput issues, whatever. That was the, the statement from AMD. So this isn't a surprise really, but as an additional note, AMD provides this AGISA code, the backbone for BIOS as binary to the motherboard vendors. So it's not like it's a really cleanly commented, easy to read like Python script or something. It's, it's just binary and 
motherboard manufacturers have told us that in theory they could reverse engineer the binary and find where that PCIe Gen 4 toggle is for the older boards and could then go back and re-enable it. But whether anyone actually does that will sort of hinge on if they think it's, it's worth it or if there's just an engineer at one of the companies who sees it as a fun project because this probably isn't something that uh, is a revenue generator for them. But anyway, that's the news on a GSEP. You should update if you've had issues with memory uh, compatibility or with Destiny, stuff like that. That's been fixed. And you shouldn't update if you want to keep using PCIe Gen 4 with the older motherboards. Up next, while discussing its quarter two earnings, Intel revealed that the company has begun shipping its 10 nanometer Ice Lake chips. Actually said that it started a while ago, back in second quarter of 2019. And during the conference call, CEO Bob Swan, who took over somewhat recently, confirmed 10 nanometer volume production for the portables and mobile segment, which isn't really, it's not what we want to see, but it's obviously a step towards what we want to see. So the quote here from Bob Swan is, we began shipping Ice Lake clients in the second quarter, supporting systems on the shelf for holiday selling season, and expect to ship Agile X, our first 10 nanometer FPGA, later this year. We now have two factories in full production on 10 nanometer. We are also on track to launch 7 nanometer in 2021 with a roughly 2x improvement in density over 10 nanometer, our 7 nanometer process, which will be comparable to the competition's 5 nanometer nodes, will put us on pace with historical Moore's Law scaling. We're also making steady progress, increasing CPU supply, Bob Swan said. Through our investments, focused execution, and tighter customer collaboration, we expect our PC CPU supply will be up to mid-single digits this year. While we expect the PC TAM to grow slightly, we'll continue to work with our customers to meet their required product mix and ramp additional capacity to ensure we are not a constraint on their growth. Intel intends to have its new chips in mobile PCs for the holiday season. The new chips, presumably Ice Lake U and Ice Lake Y, are based on the new Sunny Cove architecture and are reported to bring an 18% raw IPC increase over the previous Skylake architecture. So noticeably absent from the earnings call, again, was desktop availability. And we'll keep you updated if we hear anything on that. But we don't even have rumors right now. So no news right now. Dell already has a refreshed model from its XPS line that's in the uh, notebook lineup with Ice Lake parts. It's supposed to be a convertible. And that offers a 10 nanometer Ice Lake chip. The XPS 13 2 and 1 is configurable with either the i3 1005G1, the i5 uh, 1035G1, the i7-1065G7, uh, and then the XPS 2-in-1 model will start at $1,000 with order shipping in early September. The user benchmark sort of addresses its controversy. So originally we said we're not going to talk about this, but the company did release a statement and then kind of retracted it and then released another one. So we'll go over it quickly, but a lot of you asked us what we thought of user benchmark. This is honestly one of those things where most people asking don't care. Like, most of the people who are asking us about user benchmark have probably never used the website before because it's garbage. It's always been garbage. So that was our initial stance on it was user benchmark, like CPU boss, like GPU boss, like SSD boss, is an SEO spam website that happens to rank high because it just does SEO spam to get uh, the search terms that people are typing in for CPU A versus B rank to the top and provide no useful data. And that is what user benchmark has always been. So our initial comment on the issue of, if you missed it, uh, user benchmark basically restructured its ranking so that Ryzen looked, um, I, I guess in some ways it looked a lot worse. It ranked multi-core less heavily, weighted it less heavily in the scoring than it used to. So that was the change people were upset about. And, you know, we didn't say anything about it other than on Twitter and in a, a couple of replies on email saying, us covering this will only give them more attention from people who don't even use them anyway. So there's no value add. We don't want to bring attention to a website that we already think is just garbage. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're coming back to it. We're giving them attention anyway, unfortunately, but it's probably worth following up on now that the company has commented on it. Basically, though, here's the main problem we have with user benchmark is that you're talking about benchmarks, which really need to be done 
in a contained environment by people who know what they're doing with the same system so that you can only compare one part between all the stuff. So you're not changing like everything in the system while also trying to do a CPU benchmark. Because if you do an i9-9900K benchmark and you also have a 2080 Ti in one system and a 1080 in the other, that's a pretty damn big difference. And that'll impact the results. Memory will impact the results too, especially in the CPU memory intensive benchmarks, obviously, anything that's going through system memory. So it's a website that does comparative ranking of CPUs from one to the next between a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing and a bunch of people. And when I say that, I don't mean like people in our audience. I mean, these are people who Google searched A versus B, found that website, downloaded the program and ran it. They don't know who we are. They probably don't even know who Linus is. Maybe they've seen him once. So that's kind of the audience that user benchmark hits. It's not people in our audience, and that's why we didn't really cover it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing running a software application that is kind of stupid. It doesn't really compare anything meaningful uh, on systems that aren't the same with no methodology in place because that's how the whole thing works. And then you end up with the rank of CPUs where it says, this one's better than that one because our software that has, it's just, it's pointless. The whole thing's pointless. Uh, anyway, obviously that's what we think of user benchmark. But uh, user benchmark created no shortage of enthusiast ire when the website made those changes that sort of deranked AMD in some areas and uh, and multi-core obviously being reweighted. So the new score weighting for averages is as follows. It's 40% single core or thread, 58% quad core, 2% multi-core beyond that. And this is in contrast to the previous system where it was 40% single core, 50% quad and 10% multi-core. So the new scoring affects all processors, but it impacted AMD's Ryzen 3000 in a particularly visible fashion because they're brand new and they're really multi core uh, based and user benchmark claimed that the changes were necessary to fix uh, quote unrealistic overestimating for processors with core counts beyond eight and also said that this seems to skew the results well it what it, it ended up skewing the results in favor of lower core count cpus with higher frequencies and that obviously upset uh ardent amd fans especially but just people in general and this is kind of the problem we had with this whole story is a lot of the outrage about this was was not genuine. The, it was coming from people who never used this website, probably already thought it was garbage, and wanted something to be mad about. And then they wanted us. to. Be, they wanted me to get on camera and flip tables over and be mad about a website that provides no value to begin with. So that's the, it, it's really like, it's kind of a non-story because again, the people who are mad about it aren't mad about it for genuine reasons. These aren't like super fans of user benchmark. And a lot of people who are in that camp will probably post a comment below validating themselves saying, well, I'm just protecting the people who don't know what they're doing. Find this in the third rank Google result and, and then uh, get numbers that don't represent the processors fairly. Well, guess what? They never did because the numbers are useless, because they're not benchmarks of anything that actually have control. They're not benchmarks of real applications with real controls. It's some stupid executable you download. So anyway, uh, I guess patience is kind of low with this one because sick, but also because user benchmark was never anything worth our time to begin with. So the quote that they put out, user benchmark attempted to address the outcry it did so by updating its FAQ section with a special note regarding the, quote, AMD community. And to be fair, the AMD community is quite vocal in a much more noticeable way than any other community. But uh, in this regard, it's like user benchmark did do something that wasn't great in representing the CPUs. But again, we, we kind of have a hard time getting outraged about it because it, it's pointless anyway. Uh, so they retracted that statement. And then they issued a new one saying, following the July 2019 cohort of new CPUs, we noticed that our CPU gaming and desktop indices were overestimating all CPUs with core counts higher than eight. So both indices were rebalanced. Neither the underlying data, single quad multi 64, nor the workstation ranks were impacted. 
And they also said the rise in 3,000 gaming rank changes were net positive. 3,900x was minus 2, 3,800x plus 7, 3,600x plus 14, 3,600 plus 13. The 2000 Series 32 core threaded for 2990WX moved from 1st to 48th, and the 8 core 9900K took the top position in the gaming index up from its previous rank of 7. And then they said we frequently tune our effective speed indices and expect to add an octa core component to the index in due course. So whether or not you think that's a valid answer, at the end of the day, our answer is pretty simple. Don't use SEO spam websites that happen to hit the top ranks just by going for the search phrases and, and not actually providing any data they've created or they've collected. It's just data that they're, it's, it's user data. User data is not generally good data. It's kind of like if you go to read user reviews of let's pick something that people really screw up, a router, you read user reviews of a router on Newegg and most of them are gonna be negative. You know why they're going to be negative? They're going to be negative because it's slow, and it's not because of the router, it's because their ISP sucks. And that's why user reviews often are flawed in, in some categories specifically more than others, where it requires just a, a little bit of knowledge about the thing you're using, and people who don't have that knowledge and they're reading those reviews will think that router sucks. Well, here it's an issue where it's, it's not real benchmarks, it's not conducted by people who know what they're doing. Uh, i.e. us or any of our many competitors. There are a lot of them out there. You don't have to go to us. And uh, there's no point to visit it anyway. So moving on. AMD launches Epic 7002 series with new customers. AMD officially unveiled its second generation Epic Rome processors, marking the world's first 7 nanometer data center CPU and the second time that AMD has managed to wrestle away a fabrication improvement uh, over Intel. So that's that's absolutely noteworthy. It can't really be overstated right now. Well, that said, as Bob Swan said in uh, his own statement in the earlier news item, Intel does have, uh, we talked about this with David Cantor, but it's 10 nanometer should be pretty similar to AMD 7 nanometer. So they're not directly comparable by just that number, just 7 to 10. But Intel doesn't really have 10 nanometer in desktop and yeah, I mean it's just in mobile now. So that's that comparison doesn't even matter at this point, does it? So anyway, uh, the Epic Rome parts coming in the form of 7002 series pairs TSMC's seven nanometer process with AMD's Zen 2 architecture and chiplet-based design. The chips use a nine die approach with eight of the seven nanometer compute dies and one 14 nanometer IO die. AMD calls this the hybrid multi-die architecture and through AMD's chiplet design, Epic 7002 scales up to 64 cores and 128 threads, with the 7 nanometer chiplets being connected through a second gen Infinity Fabric. And also, Epic 7002 bears the distinction of being an x86 processor for the server space that's PCIe Gen 4 ready, with all chips offering 128 PCIe lanes by default through. Uh, though custom servers can expose up to 168 lanes if they uh, do a bit of changes. Additionally, the new Epic chips support eight DDR4 memory channels, beating Intel's six. AMD is also maintaining its aggressive price to performance ratio with competitive prices for the new Epic 7002 product stack. The 7232P base model starts at $450 for eight cores and 16 threads. And for those of you saying, wait a minute, but I can get the 3700X for cheaper than that, Keep in mind that this is a server part, so memory channels being one thing, but uh, also it's targeted to something different entirely. Meanwhile, at the top of the stack, there's 64 core to 128 thread, 7742 Epic CPUs listed at 6950, so $7,000. That may not sound like much of a bargain until you weigh it against Intel's 28 core, 56 thread, 8280, that goes for $10,000. AMD has spent a lot of time cozying up to the various customers in the industry. These are many of the same ones that Intel has been courting in recent years, or four year, years even. Uh, so with the launch of Epic 7002, AMD was joined by a lot of big players, Google being probably the most notable, Twitter, Microsoft, Dell, HPE, Cray, Cray being like sort of the original supercomputer creator, uh, and Lenovo are listed here, all adopting Epic in various capacities. And this serves to illustrate just how far AMD has come and fostering a broader ecosystem for partners with Epic, where in the server before, it was 
basically Intel, and, and that was it. It wasn't even close. And in desktop, for a while there, with FX Agent, it wasn't particularly close either, but it was, it was even less, it was even more distant, the gap in server. Intel was like over 90% easily for a while. So that's changing, and that's pretty interesting. Power outages costing WD $340 million for 13 minutes of power loss. That puts things in perspective. So in the past episodes, we talked about the power loss affecting WD and Toshiba supply of NAND, and noted that the short-term NAND prices could be impacted as a result of the several exabytes of NAND being lost. Uh, and then also in the past, the last episode, we had two stories where one was saying DRAM would go up, another said DRAM would go down. But this is this is NAND, though. Uh, so anyway, it seems that Western Digital and Toshiba have recovered from the unexpected power interruption and the fabs have returned to normal operation, but the damages come in at $339 million for WD. Toshiba did not state its damages, and those damages are mostly in lost wafers and then some equipment damage as well, although that wasn't specified. Toshiba's probably in a similar boat here. Cryorig is still in business, so a lot of you have asked us or just uh, in general posted online, but spe uh, specifically in our hardware news videos, you've been asking us if Cryorig still exists. Well, they do, and uh, this is an update provided by Tech Power Up. So Tech Power Up, thanks to them, uh, has an exclusive story on this where TPU was able to confirm that CryRig's not gone under. It's still around. And uh, TPU's most prolific news writer, BTA Runner, wrote the following. Wrote that, quote, we reached out to CryRig and one of the representatives was kind enough to respond to us with an update on what has happened at the company. CryRig is impacted by the U.S.-China trade war as the high import tariffs affected the viability of its products. The company would earlier directly access the U.S. market through exclusive stores on Amazon and Newegg, says Tech Power Up. But now uh, that's been made difficult with the tariffs. So while CryoRig has been biding its time waiting for relief in the U.S. from those tariffs, it has maintained an active present in, presence in other markets like in Asia and in Europe. And while TP reports that CryoRig will not exit the U.S. market, uh, the company will also have to access the market through an intermediary, and that will be Outlet PC going forward, who will manage the RMAs and returns as well as the product sales for CryoRig in the U.S. That should happen in early August, so sometime in the next max one week at this point, if not uh, already done. And and then the, you'll be able to buy the CryoRig stuff again. So also short note on that, the NZXT case that just came out, that H510 Elite that we didn't really particularly like at the price, that case would be something like $150 without the new tariffs. So just to keep things in perspective, it comes down from 170 it's roughly 150 with that change. Um, but that's the market that we're in right now. So if you remember the XFX RX 590 Fat Boy video card, it should be no surprise that XFX has promoted its 13-year-old responsible for naming its video cards and now has the XFX Thick with two Cs version 2. We're kind of sad that they didn't keep the boy suffix on this and go a thick boy, especially if you, you really spice it up and do an I instead of a Y. You got to keep everyone on their toes. But still, the XFX Thick is, um, is one of the earlier 5700 series cards. But anyway, the partner models are coming out. We have one of them in hand already, and we'll be testing it shortly. We don't have the Thick Boy, but we do have a partner model card. And if you had forgotten, XFX is the same company that uh, argued publicly with us on Twitter that its illegal warranty void of removed sticker that it puts on cards in the U.S. is only there because they selectively enforce it against other countries that don't have consumer protection laws that are quite as severe as ours. Not really sure why you would make the argument that you only selectively enforce something that's uh, objectively bad for the consumer, but that's the argument they chose to make. So we'll see if it's still on the thick boy when the, the card comes out. Anyway, it's supposed to be a dual fan partner model 5700 XT. We'll look at some other cards, probably not this one, and that'll be it for the news. You can pick up the foil shirt, the one that I'm wearing with the pretty sick polygon rain on the back that Andrew did on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick it up. It is, like I said, limited. We'll probably be selling out in the next maybe five days or so. We'll see how long it lasts. And otherwise, uh, thank you for watching. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus tops directly. Let us know where you think we should put 
the rest of the uh, kind of leftover LTX videos. There's one with Alex, one with Roman, and then there's one with BS Mods. So subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time. Hopefully less sick.